I'd like to invite you to stand with me for the reading of the scripture. Just a reset. Let's just stand together. And the scripture reading will be on the screen. If you're joining us, it's online. Matthew 4 and verse 8, let us read it together. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Before we seat it, let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, now take this message and find that intended heart, that fertile soil, in which your purpose and your will may be accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you missed the first message on the first temptation or the second message on the second temptation, you can find those on our church website, tvsdac.org. Just when you think you know, you find out you don't know. I looked through my archives, you know, I had in my garage a large box of half-size manila envelopes of sermons I've collected through the years when I used to type them on the typewriter. That's literally a typewriter with white out. And the fonts were very, very small. And I put that in the garage when we moved here, only to transition to computer. And I went into the garage one day and saw a box this wide and just filled with sermons, all in manila envelopes, all numbered, indicating the journey that I was on. And I look back in there to find out that this sermon was initially preached in the early 90s. And I looked at that. And I thought, wow, I was a novice. I was just snorkeling in the Word of God. And then I went back to 2003 when the sermon resurfaced again. And I found out that I bought a boat then, spiritually speaking. And I was able to enjoy more of the ocean because I was no longer snorkeling. I was able to go out into the deep. But I was still on the surface of the water. And this week, the Lord gave me some good scuba gear and said, let's go under the surface. So today, you are going to see and hear what I might refer to as a message developed in the journey of a young man who had black hair at one time. It was all there easy to find. Now it's gray and it's becoming harder to find. But one thing that is becoming easier to see is the beauty of God's Word. So today, as we dive into the final phase of the three temptations of Jesus, keep this in mind. This is a very powerful point. Everything that we would ever face in whatever category of life were covered in the three temptations of Jesus. It may be unique and something only created in our generation, yet the principle and the foundation of it existed in the time of Christ. Adam and Eve failed in three areas. Jesus succeeded in three areas. He was victorious where they failed. But today, we're going to go below the surface in a message that is so appropriate for the last days because as the first two messages, the first two temptations of Jesus Satan concealed himself, but in this temptation, he reveals himself for who he is to Christ. This quotation caught my attention in the book, Selected Messages, book one, page 285 and 286. We are told the first two great temptations, in the first two great temptations, Satan had not revealed his true purposes or his Character, meaning he hid his true purposes, he hid his true character. 
He claimed to be an exalted messenger from the courts of heaven, but he now throws off his disguise. Brethren, we are living in the hour where Satan has taken off his disguise. This is the age of intentional sin. And what's startling and frightening about it is the devil is not even trying to hide his intentions anymore. He shows himself on television. He reveals his true identity in movies, on the Internet, whether, whatever the website you are, that you go to, whatever the social media platform that you're on, you have literally got to have your eyes sanctified to not allow the devil revealing himself to affect your mind and your walk with God. Even the television commercials. You can be watching a very innocuous family show, and in the commercial, two men are kissing. Everything about this age, nothing is hidden any longer. Satan has taken off his disguise. But don't forget this. You'll find that in this temptation, he offered Jesus the dominion, the kingdoms of this world. Remember this point. When Satan offers you the dominions of this world, his intention is to establish dominion over your soul. He shows you what he's giving you, but he doesn't tell you what he's taking. And in this day and age, the world is designed to gain dominion over our souls. Never has there been a generation like this, except in the days of the antediluvian world, where their thoughts and intentions were only evil continually. We are briefly patterned out here in the country, but the moment you decide to venture on grounds that you know are not sanctified, you'll find that the devil is there. Satan is no longer hiding his intentions. But what he, has designed, what he has done is he has redesigned sin. For example, in the first temptation, he designed sin to look satisfying, the lust of the flesh. In the second temptation, he manipulated sin to make it appear attractive, the lust of the eyes. But in the third temptation, the devil has packaged this temptation to appeal to those who are struggling with egotism, the pride of life. And the Bible said, the devil took him up. When I read that passage, when I read that verse, it dawned on me that God allowed Satan for a short time. This is a chilling thought. God allowed Satan for a short time to exercise power over Christ. He would have had to in order for him to pick him up and to transport him to the highest point in the mountain. And when you look at this, this is a part of the whole trajectory, the whole journey of sin. So today, whenever, whenever the devil gains access to your life, I want you to hear me today. Whenever the devil gains access even to your Christian life, he never gains access without asking Jesus for permission to sift you. He did that to Job. If this man were without the blessings that you have given to him, I know that he would curse you to your face and die. Give me access to him. And the Lord Jesus, in his mercy over us, he said, you could do whatever you want, just don't take his life. But no one outside of Christ understood what the, what the nature of that temp temptation would be. Nobody endured what Job did other than Christ. That's why later on, Jesus granted Satan access to Peter and that's why you read in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Watch this. Before we read this, if God had not granted Satan access to Christ, Jesus could not grant Satan access to, to Peter. God granted Satan access to his son, 
Therefore, Jesus was able to grant Satan access to Peter. And that's why he said in Luke 22, verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I love this part. But I have prayed for you. Can you say amen? When you're going through your temptation, Jesus is praying for you. But let me make a point here that I, you may miss. Let me read the rest of the scripture and go back to the point. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned, or as the King James Version says, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Not only... Let me rephrase that. God granted Satan access to Christ so that he could see that there was nothing in Christ that Satan could gain access to. Jesus granted Satan access to Peter so that Peter could see that there was something in his life that Satan could gain access to. What am I saying? Whenever you are under a temptation, it may be allowed by God so that you can see the thing in your life that has allowed Satan access to you. So not all temptations are points where the devil just breaks through and comes in without God's permission. No temptation has overtaken us but such as is common to man. In every temptation that God allows to come your way, two things happen. He measures it, and he's with you in it. Come on, say amen. But also, he makes a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There is no temptation you, that you face that there's not a way out. When you read that scripture, you understand why God allowed Satan access to Christ. He had to allow him access. Because if he did not allow him access, Jesus could not have been tempted in all points just as we are unless he was exposed to the power of Satan just as we are. He had to be exposed. He had to have an experience of what it's like to be under the transporting control of the enemy of your life. I've been there. Have you been there? You know why you're still here? Because even when the devil had you in his hand, God had the devil in his hand. Uh, uh, uh. You can only go but so far. And don't make me think for a moment that it, would, it didn't pass through the devil's mind that as he was transporting Christ, he was probably thinking, if God would just let me drop him, this would be over. Praise God for his sustaining grace in the midst of our encounter with the devil. That's powerful. Had God not sustained us in the midst of our temptations... We couldn't talk about what happened when we came out of our temptations. Had God's grace not been available to us in the moment that we are face to face with the enemy of our souls, we couldn't say, God delivered me. Praise the Lord. And so you see, when you look at this temptation, yes, the devil transported him, but you see, friends, it is not the exposure of sin that we have to be concerned about. You see, if we, are, if we are exposed to sin, that is not where the... Let me, let me rephrase that. It is not a sin to be exposed to the devil's suggestions. The sin comes in embracing the devil's suggestions. The sin comes in the yielding can I refresh that and put that in a modern context? Watch out where you go on the Internet. Watch out where your tick leads to your talk. Watch out where the Instagram becomes the instant moment between ah and oh. Watch out what book you face while you're on Facebook. Because just one scroll, you could be someplace you didn't think you were headed. 
And that very moment is a decision between welcome, Bob. Bob said, I'm out of here. Those, those, those are those slice moments where the enemy is waiting for you. Okay, the next few scrolls, they'll be here. Ah, just like the commercials, they just show up. Just like the way people dress, they just show up. You go to the store and you didn't expect to see what you did. And what you do in that moment, gentlemen, <clears throat> you walk down the aisle and you say, I am not going to turn around. I am not. Believe me, I've learned to do that. I am not going to turn around. You never know who's watching. But more than that, God is watching. We were in Sam's Club yesterday. And um, you never know who's watching. And we were getting some, trying on something for my wife's feet. And I knelt down on the mat and I took her shoes off and I put it on her foot. And a lady not too far away, she said, now that's a godly man to get on his knees and take his wife's shoes off and put her, the other shoes on. I have not seen that in a long time. She says, now I can see, ah, oh, you're the guy I watch on 3ABN. <laughs> so, you wear, so you do wear jeans. <laughs> and we ended up inviting her to come to church. She'll be here next Sabbath. She was going to come today. You never know who's watching. I've learned those are those moments where you are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. There are people that are in that moment saying, I can't believe that's that guy that preaches on 3ABN. What was he watching? What was he scrolling through on his phone? What was he do What did he just say to his wife? Did I hear him say that? No, no, no. Those are those pivotal moments where your exposure can become your incarceration if your decision is not led by God's Holy Spirit. So when the Lord said, these quotes are powerful. I've got to give it to you before I dive into the message. This is just foundation. Selected messages, book two, page 286. Book one, page 286. Thank you. The last, this last temptation was the most alluring of the three. Satan knew that Christ's life must be one of sorrows, hardship, and conflict. And he thought he could take advantage of this fact to bribe Christ to yield his integrity. Let me make the first point, then the next one. Sin is designed to, to destroy our integrity. Sin is designed to destroy your integrity. Secondly, this sin was intended by Satan to persuade Christ, this is amazing, that if you would follow me, you could avoid sorrow, you could avoid hardship, and you could avoid conflict. I want this to sink in real quickly because I'm going to take us somewhere. The devil was saying to Christ, I know why you're down here. You're going to go through hardship, sorrow, conflict. You're going to be betrayed. You're going to go through trials. He understood as he saw the, the plan unfold, he saw that Christ came down here for a number of reasons, and one of those was to be a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. But he said, if you follow me, if you follow me, your life will not be a life of sorrow. It will not be a life of hardship. It will not be a life of conflict. When I studied that, it came to my mind, the Lord revealed to me, this is why Christians feel that following God should not be a life of hardship. I've heard Christians say, they ask me questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? As though giving our lives to Christ removes us from sorrow, hardship, and conflict. No, matter of fact, friends, when you give your life to Christ, it invites sorrow, hardship, and conflict. You are no longer in the stadium. You're on the field. You have an entire host of darkness against you. You ought to know that just like a football player, you're going to get hit. As you try to get towards your goal, the devil's going to hit you hard. He may knock you down, but get up in Jesus. 
But don't ever think that somehow becoming a Christian is the reason why hardship, conflict, and suffering is over. No, it just began. Not only did it just begin, the struggle against sin just began because you finally came to your understanding of what sin is. Before you give your life to Christ, sin is an easy thing. That's why the Paul said, I had not known sin except by the law. When he gave his life to Christ, he said, when the law came alive, sin revived and I died. Until he saw the commandments of God, he lived an easy life. And there are so many people that are living in the world, and we see them, and we think, man, those wealthy folk are having it easy. If I only had money like them, my life would be as easy as theirs. Don't fool yourself. That's called temporary success. God has designed something better for us than temporary pleasure, and that is eternal joy. There's a difference between pleasure and joy. Pleasure is momentary stimulation, but joy could be something that you have in the midst of your most difficult hour. Joy. Jesus did not enjoy the, endure the cross for pleasure. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. It's a joy to know that when this life is over, I've got a heaven waiting for me. What do you say? When I come out in the first resurrection, if I die before the Lord comes, which there's a 50-50 chance, if I die before the Lord comes, Curtis, I want to be in the first resurrection. Anybody else? That's the joy. Got this little small circle of 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, and you'd be so blessed like Pastor Turner to go beyond that. But even if he had 100 more years, eternal life is so much better than just the transitory moment of this season called life, a vapor, a mist. That's why people say God could have prevented this from happening. I can tell you the number of times that people have said, why didn't God stop this from happening? Ask the Father in heaven, why didn't he stop Jesus from going through trials. And so people say, why me? As I got older, I'd say, why not me? If they did that to Jesus who did nothing wrong, what makes me exempt? And then Jesus gets all distorted. The devil's intention is to distort the character of God. That's why people say, God took my son. God took my mother. God took my friend. Nothing irritates me more, makes me sad when people say, God took my baby. He needed an angel, so he killed my baby. What kind of distortion is that? And we come away with the idea that, that God has to be this interventionist, and if anything bad happens, somehow it's God's fault we ought to blame the one who's really responsible, the father of lies, the one who is the progenitor of death and suffering and sorrow and crying and pain and disappointments. Blame him. Don't blame the one who came to rescue us from it. That's why I don't like the prosperity gospel. It is a counterfeit to the true gospel. The true gospel does not omit the trials, but it says to us we can have peace in the midst of our trials. Look at John. Look at John chapter 16, verse 33. These are the words of Christ. He said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have, what friends? Peace. Why? In the world you might have tribulation. You will have tribulation. It's going to come. I don't care how it's going to come. Financial tribulation, relational tribulation, social tribulation, family tribulation, educational tribulation, whatever it comes in, whatever form, you will have tribulation. Don't fool yourself, but notice what he says. But, come on, say that. But, be of what? Good cheer. No matter what came, he says, I have overcome the world. And we can overcome through Christ. Amen. You've had those times when the illness was longer than you wanted it to be, and the doctor's report was darker than you anticipated it to be, but you went through the valley of the shadows of death only to find out that thou art with me. Amen. And you came out on the other side, probably a little smaller, less here, but a whole lot wiser. Amen. And you realize that even on your best days, I read the story about a man who had um, $89 million, $89 million, had cars 
galore, like 15 massively beautiful cars. You know the cars that we could never buy, the, the million dollar, the, the Lamborghini and the, and, the, and, the, and the Bugattis, and it just had a whole garage. I remember reading the story of Reggie, Reggie Jackson, the famous baseball player, had a whole garage of cars up in the hills of Oakland, California, and a fire hit, destroyed most of his cars in the garage. And I thought, but you're still here. You see, friends, the world tries to convince you that if you gain the accoutrements of life, somehow you will be sequestered from the trials of life, but nothing is farther from the truth. The more junk you have, let me say this, the more junk you have, the more trials you have. Isn't that right? Amen. Folks that don't have much, the minimalists. I've heard about minimalists, people that have one jacket, one pair of shoes, one umbrella, one pot, one spoon, one fork, one cup, one saucer. I saw a video on a guy that's a minimalist. He was working in a very expensive office making six figures a year, and he left his insurance job. He just trimmed off everything, had one pair of shoes, one jacket, one umbrella, and they did this whole movie called Minimalist. You know what? When he died, he ain't leaving nothing for nobody because there's nothing to leave. Nobody has to sort through his one jacket. <laughs> one pair of shoes. How much junk do we have? Come on, say amen. We got stuff. And the devil tries to get us linked to that stuff. And what we define tribulation mean is we can't find our car keys. That's not a tribulation. That's just your memory going bad. <laughs> That's not a tribulation. That's just life. When you can't, you can look at somebody all day long and you can't remember their name. That's not a tribulation. That's called you need Prevagen. That's what that, that's life. It happens to us all. We all get to that place where, you know how you're getting old. This is, this, I'm, I'm in the category now, so I could say this. When it takes three people to remember one person's name. <laughs> and you know how it is when you get home, you remember their name and you rejoice. Hey, yeah, you know who that is. <laughs> you, get, you, you get home and you remember their name when they're like long gone. Uh, yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who is that, honey? Yeah, good to see you again. You know you're getting past that point where it's like, and then you get home and, and it's like both of you, while you're pulling in the driver, you say, his name is Curtis. <laughs> and you feel happy. And you remember, well, when I see him again, I'm going to say, I didn't forget your name. I just didn't mention it. <laughs> That's life. That's not tribulation. That's the cycle of life. We come in pristine, skin as tight as a drum, no wrinkles anywhere to be found, and we hit the pike. And we start sliding down the other side, and we notice a wrinkle, a line. Then all the ladies start spending millions on those line-disappearing creams. And, and then when those don't work, they go to plastic surgery. Then all that stuff, ladies, don't waste your time. Amen. You're going to look flawless in the kingdom. Amen. Come on, husband, say amen. amen. So let your wife know she's beautiful like she is. I tell my wife, honey, you're beautiful. Am I really? Honey, you're beautiful. Why do you say that? Because you're mine. That's why. See, that's what makes life beautiful. We don't mind getting old as long as we get old together. Come on, old people say amen. As long as you got somebody to get old with. That makes all the difference. How did I get all that out of one scripture? I don't know. <laughs> but you see, in this sermon, the Lord is in the midst of the of the greatest challenge of his life. And the Bible says the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain. What kind of mountain? Exceedingly. An exceedingly high mountain. Some commentators said it may have been Mount Nebo where Moses received the commandments or where Moses looked over into the promised land, a 2,500-foot peak. But whatever it may be, this mountain peak was high enough for the devil to show the Lord all the kingdoms of this world. From the day of Christ all the way to the very end of time. Can you imagine Jesus saw Las Vegas? He saw New York City, Times Square. He saw all the opulent cities before they were even built. And the devil said, I'll give you all that. That's a frightening thing. If you saw all of that, if you saw all of that opulence, all that wealth, all that material possession, and the devil said, I will give you all that, what would your next reaction would have been? What would your next reaction be? Amen. 
That's why some people leave the Adventist church because they're looking for exceedingly high mountains. If your desire is to embrace the kingdoms of the world, the devil will prepare you an exceedingly high mountain. And before you know it, that mountain will lure you away from Christ. He may show you the benefits, but he'll always conceal the fact that nothing in this world is eternal. Everything about this world is transitory. Look at 1 John 2, verses 16 and 17. Everything about this world is transitory. Satan conceals the facts. He'll say, you can have this job, you can have this car, you can have that position, you can have that office, you can have that house, you can have that notoriety. People will call your name in their sleep. You can have all that, but one day nobody's going to remember your name. And your house will be empty. And you'll be just a good old stone in a cemetery somewhere. He doesn't tell you the truth. That's why Jesus said, for all that is in the world, let's say it together, what are they? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And here's the truth that Satan conceals. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But, there's that word again, Ricky, but he who does the will of God abides how long? Forever. Somebody asked me, I was in New York a few weeks ago, and um, young pastor said, Pastor, pastor Loma McCain, what What's your driving force? I said, I want to let you know it changed through the years. When I was a young man, it was different. But now that I'm getting up in age, I just want to please God. That's it. That's all I want. When I read about Abraham, when I read about Enoch, these men that walk with God and please God, was a friend of God, I thought, that's enough for me. I just want to please God. So I stopped preaching for popularity. I stopped preaching for praise and accolade. I stopped preaching for people to say, that was a great message. Praise God if it was. That's not the point. But may God always receive the praise in every area of our lives that belongs to him. I just want to please God. I want to, you know, I want to just be in that list when the role is called up yonder. I just want to be there because the kingdoms of this world and all their glory are transitory at best. Remember Nicole Simpson? Is it Nicole? Uh, no. Who is the, the young? Nicole. That married that guy that was, she was like 31 and he was 90. Anna Nicole Smith. She did not marry him for his looks. When we saw that on the news, he was 31 years old. The guy is 90. And she's hugging him like he's a teddy bear. She ain't seeing him. She's seeing all his dollar signs. I love him. It's like when you want to kind of say, uh, sir, sir, sir. The kingdoms of this world, that's the dollar signs in our eyes. The kingdoms of this world are in these categories. You're old enough to remember the lifestyles of the rich and famous. If anybody's old enough, to raise your hand. You young folk, Robin Leach, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Remember that? I watched that show, and I frustrated myself to no end. I don't know why I watched it whenever it came on. They show you everything you couldn't afford. Remember that, Donna? Everything you couldn't afford. And, you cl and you, you, when the show is done, now next week, for another, tune in next week for another episode of the lifestyle of the rich and famous. You frustrate yourself week after week, month after month, year after year, when they just wag all their stuff in front of you. The only thing that gave me joy, my wife and I were down in Southern California. We were at this uh, place where all the wealthy people were. We just ended up, when we lived in California, ended up driving to the Kodak Theater. And it just so happened to be during the time of the year where all the limousines were there. All the limousines. All the red carpet. And there were all these blackened windows on these long limousines. And, and there we were in our Nissan Maxima. Looked like we did not belong. It's like, what is he doing in this block? Well, we're trying to find somebody. We're trying to just get a glimpse. You know how it is? You get inoculated by that. You want to just get a glimpse of somebody that you might recognize. There he is, Tom Cruise. You, know, you want to do something like that. I mean, come on now. You understand what I'm saying? That's, all, that's, that's how drugged we are. We want to see the guy we saw on television. But nobody's showing themselves. And I, I noticed 
just one limousine started rolling down the window, and I said, Angie, An An look, look, look. All you saw was like a... <laughs> couldn't tell who it was. It was frustrating. And on the way driving back up to Northern California where we lived, I was like, we just wasted our whole afternoon trying to see somebody that don't even give a, a hoot about us. And as I was on my way back, you know, the Lord said, don't worry about it. One day, you're going to be in the, in the New Jerusalem, and they're going to see you through the walls. Amen. I said, I like that. There's going to be a switch one day. They're hiding behind their darkened windows. One day, I'm going to be hiding behind the transparent walls of the New Jerusalem. Amen? That's what I need. The lifestyle of the rich and famous, the glory of the world, the glitz and glamour of the major cities, the opulence of materialism and the law of gambling. Go to places like Las Vegas and just walk the strip. No, don't go. No, no. On second thought, don't go. You've got to be sanctified, glorified, and blind to go to Las Vegas. Don't go if your eyes work. It's a city of sin. They tell you that. The devil has taken off the, the, disguise, the city of sin. Why would you want to go there? Why was I there? For the electronic show. And I made it out alive. Hallelujah. You got the entertainment and music industry, the kingdoms of the world, the new American idol, the voice. Everybody wants to be the voice. Everybody wants to be the new American idol. Transitory kingdoms. Then you see the Oscars, the Grammy, the American Music Awards, and we sit down in our houses and we say, if only I was on that list, I could be well known. I had one of those moments once. I told you about that. Sitting on the edge of my bed one day, I had the nerve to watch the Grammy Awards. Heard a guy that couldn't sing a lick. He was getting a Grammy Award, and I said to Angie, I can sing way better than that. Well, how did that happen? How did that happen? He can't even sing. And nowadays, most of the people getting awards can't sing. Come on, say amen. It's just a bunch of light, camera action, and all this nonsense. Get rid of all that stuff. Just sing. Give them a microphone, and you won't, won't pay them a dime. But people are stumbling over themselves to want to be all that. But I want to tell you, friends, you may not be in any of those categories, but when the spirit of covetousness and the desire to be recognized and praised grips you, you are going after the kingdoms of the world. When we cease to be content with walking with Jesus, the pride of life will begin to creep in and Satan will find a foothold in our lives. My first point, there is no such thing as a risk without a risk. There's no such thing as a risk without a risk. Satan tried to get Christ to embrace the notion that there is no risk going after the world. And some of us fall into that category financially. Anybody here know about debt? Mm -hmm. no, no amens necessary. You know, you've heard the phrase before. Only five easy payments. What makes payments easy? I always try to figure that out. You heard that one? And then you, get, you fall into the category, this one, no payments until 2024. Then all of a sudden you forget to pay and all that whole year of interest just come pouring in. That happened to my wife and me once. We got a washer at Sears and we said, you know, 90 days, same as cash. We figured you, we could get that paid off in 90 days. Well, day 91 came and we didn't get it paid off and all that interest came back. They got evil on us. 90 days, same as cash, but day 91 comes and all the interest shows up. Those are the phrases, the kingdoms of this world. And then they say, uh, 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 Curtis, try it out risk-free because they know that when you get hooked, you'll pay anything you need to to keep that thing. Zero percent financing for the first year, but after next year, 29 percent interest. That's why some of you are still in debt because you fell for that lie. Zero percent financing. No obligations until you start hiding from the phone when it rings. No obligations. No one will call you. And you look down, 800-643-9172. That ain't my mother. Don't pick it up. That's what happens when the world grabs you. Buy one, get the second one half off. 
What do you do? You buy too many. You can't even afford one. That's the kingdoms of the world language. Sign here, and it's yours. In fact, sign here, and you're ours. That's the reality. You get locked down in debt. And believe me, there's nothing truer when the Bible says the borrower is a slave to the lender. Safe to say, honey, isn't that wonderful? When you're out of debt, come on, somebody say amen. Isn't it freedom? freedom. When you're out of debt and the phone rings, you can answer it. And when stuff comes in the mail, this world is terrible. That's what they do. In the world you live in, when you're out of debt, what do they do? They send you credit card offers. Right? Companies that you never heard of that even paid attention to you. American Express, we'd like to invite you to participate in this special offer. But it's only good for 15 days. Brethren, sisters, tear it up and throw it in the garbage. Come on, say amen. That's what happens. Because when you look at all these things, what, what Ellen White says, and this is a powerful statement, Jesus looked at the glory presented before him, but instead of keeping his gaze fixed on it in deep contemplation, I love this, he turned away. Did you grab that? It is when you keep looking and you say, wow. Wait up, wait up, Jasmine, wait up, wait up. Wow. Wow. It's when you keep looking, Ricky, that the problem arises. When your gaze is fixed and you can't get that out of your mind, that's what happens. And you know what I like about the Bible? Is the Bible records what happens when your gaze is fixed on something that is not a part of God's plan. Go with me to Psalm 73. This is a warning to every one of us. Look at Psalm 73 talks about a young man who was a musician in the temple of the Lord. He went to the mall one day and got messed up. Look at Psalm 73, verses 1 through 7. Look at what he said. Truly God is good to Israel. Truly God is good to who? Israel. To such as are pure in heart. There's that word again. But as for me. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly what? Slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride, what's that word, friends? Pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. That is the kingdoms of this world. Don't allow the things you see to become the things you lust after. Because you know the reality of it is when they die, they can't put even the smallest ring in their coffin with them. They can't put anything that they have acquired in this life in that coffin with them. Don't be envious and boastful of those who have great possessions because while they're boasting about it, there is a day of reckoning coming for every one of us where nothing that we have done can get us off this planet except Christ be the central focus in our lives. Which brings me to my second point. I just have two more. And here's the lesson you learn about that. The longer the gaze, the greater the temptation. Say that with me. The longer the gaze, the greater the temptation, the greater the deception. Jesus knew that. He under Do you think that Jesus understood the pull of sin? Do you think he understood the gravity of what sin can do to us? Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. This is the reason why he wrote these words to us. This is the reason why he wrote these words to us. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness is the seed of every one of the commandments being broken. That one commandment is the seed, the catalyst of every other commandment being broken. And here's the reason why we should beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You ever have spring cleaning? 
Anybody? Anybody involved in that right now? Getting rid of stuff? My wife and I, we said this just to, to, to each other the other day. Man, the more we throw out, the more we realize we have. Are we the only ones? And I said, honey, we got to keep going. One day we'll find the walls. Those of you that have been married a long time, husband, watch your wife. Wife, watch your husband, because somewhere along the way, covetousness starts to creep in. And we think we need more until we realize nothing around us can make it into the kingdom. Nothing that we possess can open the doors to the kingdom for us. Don't allow your possessions to possess you, is what this statement is saying. In the Bible commentary, it was pointed out that it was as if Satan said to Christ, this is a powerful statement, you came to earn title to this world, did you not? Accept it as a gift from me. Power and honor may be yours for the taking. But in return, all Satan asked was a transfer of allegiance from the Father to himself. Anytime you fall for the enemy's suggestions, it always results in a transfer of your allegiance from your heavenly Father to the devil himself. That's what he was asking Christ for. The underlying suggestion, if you serve me, the world is yours. If you serve me, nothing in the world will be withheld from you. That's what he was, in essence, saying to Christ. He was trying to give him what already belonged to him. That always amazed me. I'm going to give you the world. He knew the world was God's. He knew the world was created by Christ. But in his humanity, he sought to take advantage of Christ's humanity. Because in his humanity, nothing belonged to him. In his divinity, everything belonged to him. We've got to understand when we have a divine connection with Christ, realize the divine connection with Christ means that we've got to disconnect from all of the voices of this life because God didn't come to create a comfortable kingdom down here. Our kingdom is the kingdom that is soon to come. It's not down here. It's not from here. That's why Matthew 12 and Matthew 13, 22 warns us nothing will damage your spirituality like the deceitfulness of riches. Matthew 13, 22, notice. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, look at this, and the cares of this world, and what else? The deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. I know a lot of people that left the church because the voice of fame grabbed them. I can mention names, but I would choose not to do that. I can know people that I went to church with that are very talented, very well, very well able to sing and play instruments and very good at what they do, but now their voice is on billboards and it's not in the book of life because they decided that the world is more important than being firm with Christ and giving your allegiance to Christ. Beware of of the deceitfulness of riches that choke the word and we become unfruitful. This man by the name of Oswald Sanders in a book called The Spiritual Clinic, look at what he wrote. Amazing statement. He said, money is one of the acid tests of character and a surprising amount of space is given to it in Scripture. Whether a man is rich or poor, observe, this is powerful, observe his reaction to his possessions and you have a revealing index of his character. Isn't that powerful? Observe a man's reaction to his possessions. You remember the story of Hezekiah? God gave him 15 more years. What did he do at that time? Show everybody in his house. Look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. Brethren, don't become enamored by your possessions. They're all going to leave you behind. They are all going to be left behind. That's why Matthew 6 and verse 24, we read these words. In the NIV, I like the way it says it here. No one can serve how many? Two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what else? You cannot serve God and money. I like what Benjamin Franklin said. Beware of little expenses. It only takes a small leak to sink a great ship. 
Oh, the, oh, I could afford that. I could afford that. I could afford that. I could afford that. It's only $6 a month. I could afford that. I could afford that. And you realize your check is gone on the first of the month because <laughs> you could afford everything, but now you can't afford to pay what you often said you could afford. Those little leaks, those little financial obligations, and the world is so clever nowadays, they break it down into small increments. That's why those of you that are on Apple, you got to watch out. Stay away from the Apple store. It's dangerous. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, they, they make it, well, you can have Apple Music for only $9.99 a month. Add that up. And then you get these new programs nowadays. Well, it's only $4.99 a month. So you got that one, you got another one. You download this app that has recipes. Well, it's only $6.99 a month. And you start adding all that up, and you start realizing, I'm in debt to Apple. And I've been giving Apple more than I've been giving God. That's why they have a little bite in their Apple. Because it is the lore of the accoutrements of this life Warning, Paul warned his young protege named Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, for the love of money. What is that, friends? Is money evil? No. Money is not evil. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their what? Greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We were checking out of the store, and I saw this article. As we were checking out of the store yesterday, <clears throat> a man who won $29 million. And in five years, he was penniless living in a shelter. How does that happen? Won $29 million in a lottery. In a few years, he was, he was penniless and living in a shelter that he bought with that money, living in a shed that he bought with that money. How does that happen? Greediness pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So be careful. Don't serve God for money. As this English proverb said, he who serves God for money will serve the devil for better wages. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Now, let's go to the third point, which is powerful, and then we get to the last point, which is going to really open your eyes to something you haven't seen. The deception of the third temptation. I want you to get this. The deception of the third temptation, Donald, was in its directness. We know that it was full of deception, but this is the one temptation where the devil didn't totally tell a lie. He was open and clear and honest. He made it very clear about his intentions. He didn't try to hide it. He said, I'll give all this to you if you fall down and worship me. So the pursuit of greatness, success, and possessions don't forget it, is always conditional. There's always a condition when you open that door. When the devil said in, in Matthew 4 and verse 9, all these things I will give you, here's the condition. What's the next word? Yes. If you fall down and do what? Worship me. Now let's get deeper into this. Satan knew that the mission of Jesus was not just to save us. Amen. But the mission of Jesus is also to rescue the world back from Satan that had been lost by Adam's fall in the garden. Jesus came to reclaim the dominion of the world, and Satan also knew that his reign would come to an end if Jesus wrestled the world from his possession. So what he did, what he decided, and be careful, watch out when people try to create a partnership with you in sin. He said, we don't have to fight over this. We don't have to argue over this possession. I'll give it to you, but you got to worship me. I'll give all this to you. The condition's not that big. Just read the fine print. Matter of fact, ignore the fine print. Just agree to take it all. I'll give it to you if you fall down and worship me. This temptation is deeper, though, than material possession, fame, and self-importance. The kingdom of this world, and this is what I was telling my Sabbath school class, the kingdom of this world has a deeper meaning. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Can you say amen? Now watch this. I wasn't ready for it when I found it. The Lord revealed this to me. When the devil offered Christ the kingdom of this world, 
This was the temptation where Satan did not send his angels to tempt Christ. He made it his mission. I want you to hear me. The kingdoms of this world are more than wealth and fame and fortune and finances and possession and accolade and visibility and all the praise that the world gives you for your success and for your abilities. It's far deeper than that. When he offered Christ the kingdoms of this world, he sought to create a union. You're not going to see it coming. He sought to create a union between Christ and the political kingdoms of this world. I want you to grab this. Look at this. The Bible commentary takes us down that road. He sought to create a union between the political kingdoms of this world and Christ. He sought to establish divine authority over the political affairs of man. This temptation, look at this. The Bible commentary brings us out on Matthew 4, verse 9. In refusing to comply with Satan's proposal, Christ also disavowed any unholy alliance between church and state. Christ refused to interfere with the nations of his time. How often did he refuse? Consistently and how? Completely. Now, this is crazy. This is crazy. Satan, Lord, give me the mind to say this correctly. Satan sought to merge church and state by saying to Christ, you need to exercise divine authority over political issues. What he failed to do with Christ, he has succeeded to do with the church today. All these issues that are looking for religious, ish, religious input, all these issues that are political, that are seeking religious support, are the very thing that the devil did, is the very thing that Satan did in the garden, is the very thing he did in the wilderness. He sought to create a union between Christ and the kingdoms of this world. But watch this. What he failed to do then, what he failed to do through Christ, he is succeeding by doing that today. Today, Satan is sending his evil angels to create a merger between church and state through the influence of evil powers. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Remember, he offered Jesus the kingdoms, but look at what he's doing in Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of what? Demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to do what? Gather them together, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Let's break this down. You know, it was the alliance. I'll show you how this worked. He had succeeded to do that between the Jews and Rome, did he not? It was the alliance between the Jews, religion, and Rome, politics, that led to the rejection of Jesus. That's the first foundation. The Jews claimed to serve God, but they had a greater alliance to Rome. Furthermore, to maintain that political support of the Jews, Pilate reinforced the interests of the Jews and ended up crucifying Christ. Did you see what happened there? The Jews say, we are God's servants, but they had a greater alliance to political issues. I hope you're hearing me today. And the political leaders, seeing the support of the church, sought to maintain that connection between them and religion and decided, religious leaders, you tell us what you want us to do and we will do it. Brethren, that is how the mark of the beast is going to be urged upon the world by a union between church and state. The church will ask for the state's support in inserting and advancing their dogmas and the state will acquiesce to the church because it needs its support. Is it happening today? Is it happening today? Yes. 
It happened in Jesus' day. Look at this. They made it clear. The Jews said Pilate is more important to us than Christ. Here's what they said. John 19, 15. Look at it. But they cried when they asked, for well, who do you choose? But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? That shows you how much they looked at him as the king. And the chief priests, that's the major leaders in their religious circles of those days, answered and said, we have no king but Caesar. Let me tell you, that this I didn't even see this coming up in this message. That's what I talk about. There's a twist. I didn't even see that in the message. I preached this sermon twice before in intervals in the 90s and 2003, but I never saw that. But the Lord showed me that. When they said they have no king but Caesar, one of the greatest dangers facing the church today is creating a political alliance between the church and political fractions. Did you hear what I said? Look what Ellen White says about it. Testimonies for the church. Volume 9, page 218. Again and again, this is in Christ's day. Again and again, Christ had been asked to decide legal and political questions. But he refused to interfere in temporal matters. If Christ refused, what should we do? The same thing. But the church today has thought somehow that the world needs our guidance. The world needs Christ, but it doesn't need the church's support. Did you hear what I said? There's a difference between the church preaching the gospel and the church supporting the world. We are called to proclaim the gospel to the world, not to become proponents to support the world. Look what it goes on to say. He stood in our world as the head of a, the greater spiritual kingdom. And he came to our world to establish the kingdom of what? Righteousness. Amen. Speaking of Christ, his teachings made plain the ennobling, sanctifying principles that govern this kingdom. That is his kingdom. He showed that justice and mercy and love are the controlling powers in Jehovah's kingdom. Brethren, our alliance should be fully on the side of heaven. Leave political issues alone. We are called to be champions of eternal issues. Can I say amen? I'll say amen. Amen. That's why when Paul went down to Corinth, this is what he said, and this is what we should be saying today. When they appeal to us for political support, we should say like Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Somebody asked me once in the store. They had the mistake to ask me this. They made the mistake. Who do you support? I said, nobody. Who do you vote for? I don't want to vote for anybody. They said, why not? I said, who Calm down, John. What president ever promised to forgive me of my sin? None of them. Which leader ever said, I will supply all your need according to my riches and glory? None of them. Which one said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also? None of them. They said, but you ought to support something. I said, I do. I support the kingdom of light. And if you don't know that, if you can't see that, brethren, you are in the category where this seduction of politics, where this seduction where you think somehow they need the church's guidance. No, they need the guidance of the Lord. They don't need your support. And so many people give money to these political parties, and the gospel is languishing in evangelism. People giving thousands to get another man in office when we should be giving to bring souls to Christ's kingdom. And we will give an account of that day. Last point. What Satan could not accomplish through three temptations, Christ accomplished through one command. Come on, somebody, say amen. Here it is, the closing point. I want to invite the praise team to come up. By the time you get up here, I think I'll be ready. What Satan could not accomplish in three temptations, Jesus accomplished through one command. What did he say? Matthew 4.10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written. Come on here. Let's hold it up. For it is written. For what? 
it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Oh, I love about the statement, what I read in, in First Selected Messages, book 1, page 288. Look at what happened here. When the Lord said, Away with you, Satan, Ellen White says, the hateful presence of Satan was withdrawn. The contest was ended. With immense suffering, Christ's victory in the wilderness was as complete as the failure of Adam. Somebody ought to say amen. Adam failed completely. Christ was victorious completely. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, but end it with me. Even so in Christ, how many all shall be made alive. Jesus Christ was victorious on every point where Adam failed. Jesus succeeded. And then finally, this is the part that I didn't get either, but I saw this in the closing. Verse 11 brings us out. You see, the angels that Jesus commanded in glory, they had to stand back and watch this controversy going back and forth. They had to stand back and watch this, this battle between light and darkness, good and evil, Christ and Satan. They could not intervene in any particular. And believe me, they wanted to intervene. They wanted to come in and be the, the reinforcements that Christ needed. They could not intervene. Why? The angels had to allow Adam's choice to be replaced with Christ's choice. They could not intervene to stop Adam from sinning. They could not intervene from stop, to stop Christ from being tempted. But when did they intervene? Verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, what is that saying? Don't let that be a final thought. Here's what it said to me. When Jesus made the choice not to obey Satan, only then, Tracy, could the angels step in. You'll get that on Tuesday, but just so, since I can't wait till Tuesday, let me tell you what I just said. When we choose not to obey Satan, God's angels will step in and minister to us. When we choose to serve him, his angels are dispatched to our side. I got one on my right. How you doing? Got one on my left. We'll talk again in the kingdom. The angels of the Lord encampeth round about those who fear him and deliver them. Come on, say amen. You don't see it, but I got secret service protection. I got me some angels. But what is the story all about? Satan promised, Satan promised success outside of the path of obedience. But Jesus guarantees success within the path of obedience. So my question to you today is, which, which path would you want to be on? The one outside that lies to you but gives you things that appeal to your eyes and your pride and your senses and your desires and your lusts? Or well, the path that appears to be hard and difficult, but if you stay on it, it's just a rough path to the most beautiful city you have never seen. To a glorious place, no sickness, no illness, no death, no suffering, no pain, no crying. I'm going to stay on that rugged path until I make it to the kingdom. Anybody else? Don't fall for the devil's lies. Christ succeeded where Adam failed. And Christ can succeed, but here's the key. You've got to choose not to yield, and Christ will send his angels to minister in your behalf. So here's my appeal today. Do you want the world or do you want Jesus? I think we should stand and sing our testimony. The devil wants the world to be all that you need, but I've discovered Jesus is all the world to me. Let's sing that. The first and the last stanza. This is the joy. This is all the world Let's raise that to me. My life, my joy, my love. That's right. He is my strength from day to day. Look at that.
this I don't want this just to kind of be great great okay go let's go eat I want you to consider what was said here today Jesus succeeded in every area that we would ever be tempted does that bring you good news I don't have to face the temptation and succumb to it I don't have to say it's too great it's too powerful it's too much I can't deal with it I could just simply choose not to yield and I will get divine aid Somebody here today is struggling with something. I know that. That's how it is. That's life. We all struggle. But today I want to ask you, the Lord will see your hand raised. If you say, Father, I need the strength to know that when those temptations come, when those challenges come, when those moments come, yes, when those moments come, I need the wisdom to say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to choose to serve God, although I can't see my way out. I'm going to choose not to fall for the schemes of this world to keep me bound endlessly, financial prison. I want to be free in Christ. I'm not going to allow the voices of this world to call me away from my allegiance to give me a temporary throne that will end in the fires of destruction. I'm going to stay on that path. It may be rugged, but they tell me when I get through all the foliage, I'll see a kingdom I've never seen before. Today, Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Let's sing that as our testament. Jesus is all. Let's raise that for I want no kind of friend you want, friends? Don't let your eyes decide who that friend is. Don't let your eyes deceive you. Don't let your desires betray you. Don't let your thoughts incarcerate you. Look beyond the here and now. Look beyond the wilderness. Look beyond the journey that we're now in. Today to the day when you will hear, come ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for you, for you, from the foundation of this world. That's where I want to be. When he unfolds stuff I had never seen. We get excited about an iPhone. Oh, wait till Jesus, we will be able to communicate without touching anything. Calling Roger. Where are you? I'm spending the day with Elijah. Where are you? I'm talking to Enoch. How far away? Oh, 27 million light years, but I'll meet you this afternoon. That's the kind of stuff that messes with me. Y'all can keep all this stuff down here. I want that kind of stuff. Don't have to touch a button. Hey, David, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm over here visiting with Peter. How's Peter doing? Well, he's talking about his journeys on the boat, and I'm talking about how God delivered me through my temptation. That's what I imagine. That's the world I'm looking forward to. It may sound imaginary, but I had not seen, ear had not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God prepared for those that love him. Don't let the devil deceive you on this tiny little ball of confusion when God has got so much more we've never seen. Father in heaven, yes, you are all the world to us. The devil knows that. So he tries to take advantage of our senses. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. But you've reminded us, you've reminded us all those things are of the world. The world is fading away, vanishing away, and the lusts thereof. But Father, may we be found at the end of that sentence. But he who does the will of my Father abides forever. I pray from the, for the youngest to the oldest in this congregation, those watching, those listening. The devil will call your voice. The devil will call your name. The door will 
Somebody will knock at your door. Some offer will come in the mail. Some kind of salesman will try to use his prowess to deceive you. Don't fall for that voice. Don't allow your heart beat to thirst for what you see on television. Don't allow the fame of this life to deceive you into thinking it'll be different for you. It's not different for anybody. The devil lies to cause us to become his victims. But Jesus told us the truth to become his children. May we choose that road that will one day burst through the trials of this life into the beauties and the joys forevermore. I pray that that's our desire and our prayer and our focus. And may Jesus Christ be glorified in all of our decisions. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.